good afternoon and welcome. I'd like to introduce myself briefly. I'm Jason Fisher, Extension Forester for Southside. And so I'm going to do a, a short session for you on one topic that we get a lot of questions on. Uh, but first, a little bit of background. Uh, my, most of the work I do uh, in teaching chainsaw safety, I do with a colleague with another agency with the Sharp Logger program. And so a lot of what we teach uh, has to do with OSHA standards and safety measures as well as just common sense approach tactics uh, to what to do in the woods when you're running a chainsaw. So first we need to just emphasize that if you can get someone to do the work for you, even if you have to pay them, please do. But oftentimes we get people uh, that have a storm event and a tree's blown over in the yard, uh, which we get a lot of that. Uh, or they just want to go out and cut firewood and so they take measures upon themselves to go do that without first thinking about their own personal safety and the safety of others for that matter. Uh, types of chainsaws. I won't spend a lot of time in, in that uh, other than to tell you that first you need to pick a, a model that you can handle, okay? Uh, physically handle. Uh, steel, uh, farm boss, this is a 290. And, and as I get older, I'm looking hard at the, the next model below, okay? I get asked some about the battery-operated chainsaws. I've run those. Uh, they work great. Uh, uh, an advantage I see of them is you don't have to deal with the, the mess of oil and gas, obviously. Uh, the batteries are very expensive, uh, however, uh, if you're going to choose to get an electric chainsaw, my advice to you is to use it for limbing uh, and cutting small trees. Alright, so personal protective equipment. A couple things with you today. Uh, we're going to start with the head and work down to our feet. And I have prescription glasses on, and they help me see. But unless I've got a prescription pair that has side protection on it, I'd want to use uh, safety glasses like this to protect your eyes. That's a that's a must. So we're starting with our eyes, and this headgear here, which you rarely see anybody cut with. I get it, but. What we're going to teach is the proper thing that you need to be doing because it's important that you return safely to do it again another day, right? So hard hat. All right, and you can see if I press in on the side, it's kind of hard with that. This one's holding up well because I keep it inside out of the elements and away from the sun. Um, if you happen to have a hat that's been setting and sun has been exposed to it, it can uh, begin to, to dry rot and it can crack. So to test your hard hat, if you have one laying around, you want to check that. Uh, so head protection is key because of falling debris. Uh, dead limbs, uh, just uh, the top of a tree may fall out, whatever. And keep in mind, hard hats are designed to deflect object. Okay, so object would fall hit the hard hat and deflects off to the side. And that's why this webbing inside, you move these earmuffs out of the way so you can see that. The webbing inside is, is meant to absorb and twist. You can adjust it on, with a dial on the back for your head size. The key thing is nothing goes in between the webbing and the top of your hat, okay? Like a sandwich, extra pair of gloves, okay? So keep that space free. So moving down to ear protection, this hat happens to have earmuffs already attached to it, which is great. So that's something you don't have to leave at home and forget. Just regular earplugs work. Head, ear, and eyes, that, that takes care of that part. We're going to move down to the legs, okay, to chaps. Chaps, uh, they're just like wearing a pair of pants, coveralls. Uh, they're not cheap, but that is a Kevlar and ballistic nylon material. Uh, I have these for cold weather cutting. They're practically new. I haven't been worn much, but 
we're going to go best to second best. So best is going to be a pants type of coveralls if you can afford those. Um, in this case, mine are demo only. I don't wear them all the time, but I do wear these. So this is an apron type chap. And so it would go down around your waist here, and then the, the straps would be tightened on the back sides of your legs. Okay. And so the key thing is that these straps, which these have a, a clip type buckle, these straps need to be tight, almost to the point where they're uncomfortable. You don't want the pants slipping very loosely around on your leg. A section right here on these chaps where I learned a lesson this past winter. Okay, so pay attention. Okay, you see in the sun here, see this rip? And it's not big. You see the material that's coming out of there? Okay, that's that ballistic nylon. I saw that fly right up by my face. And the short of the story is essentially I was being careless. Uh, being careless in that I was tired. Um, a friend and I were cutting. That's the first point I want to make to you is tell somebody where you're going, okay? But I had someone with me. They were a distance away, at least two tree links. We were both uh, cutting and releasing oak trees. So we're doing crop tree release. And so we were moving along pretty, pretty good pace. And we were cutting trees probably not much bigger than our thigh. So it's pretty quick work, but it, it took a lot of time. So basically, uh, I got tired. I went through a whole tank of gas. And for me personally, uh, my limits are once I run through a tank of gas, I, I stop about 10 minutes and rest. I was on my second tank and hadn't rested, so I was tired and I was careless. And uh, what I failed to do was to put my chain brake on before I stepped and made motion to go cut the next tree. So the, the chain was still running on the bar. When I stepped forward, the chain caught these chaps right here. And so the chaps did their job, essentially, is what, I, what I'm trying to share with you. They did what they were supposed to do. Had the chain been running a little faster, probably would have ripped a bigger hole. And it, it did pull these chaps around on my leg a little bit, is the other point I wanted to make. That last area would be foot protection. And I have steel toe boots here made in the good old US of A. And so a steel toe boot is certainly best. Uh, protects from heavy objects, uh, even a tree rolling over on the end of your toe if, if you're standing where you shouldn't be. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about a used saw. So let's say you, you find one on uh, online for sale or your neighbor has one that's used, okay? In this case, make sure the chain brake is working. So if I push upwards, I can now slide the chain on the bar. You hear that? Now I cannot, okay? So that chain brake, when I was telling you earlier about me getting tired and stepping forward, that's what I was talking about. So prior to me stepping forward, the saw was running. You know, I can guess it. I should have just pushed that forward just like that. Real, real easy step. It's actually meant, meant to be done right there with your hands, pushing forward, okay? The other thing is the guide bar here, where my hand is, that is your sight. So you're sighting down this bar straight away from you to choose your notch uh, direction and the direction you want the tree to fall. So it's pretty cool. <clears throat> Throttle interlock, that's a piece here on the handle. See that? Okay, that should be there. In other words, I, if I pull the trigger with the gas here, it's a safety. It, it can't, I can't rip it up until I put my hand on and depress that, uh, that safety feature, okay? So make sure that's on there, that's important. So, and then the last piece is down in here, and that's the chain catch peg. Right there where my finger is, okay? So that's a peg there, in case the chain were to break and come off, it would catch on that and it wouldn't come flying out and harm someone. Is when you're cutting, um, make sure there's not anyone standing directly in line of where you're pointing this saw, okay? Um, when I used to teach hunter safety, uh, we used to ask people, hey, what's the first thing you do when you pick up a firearm? And they would always say, always, the answer was, make sure it's not loaded or check the safety is on. 
both of which are correct, but not the right answer. The best answer is control the direction of where you're pointing that. That way no wood can get hurt. So your first thing to think of is, well, my chain's probably not gonna come off, and it probably won't. But in the event that it does, you can at least prevent that. So that's a safety measure I wanna tell you about, is when you're doing your cutting, make sure there's no one standing in the direction of where you're pointing. A lot of folks don't think about that, but it's just, you know, can you be too safe? No. Okay, so saving a little time, I've took off the back of the saw here. You just turn this uh, piece here, this dial, and it pops right off. <clears throat> and I've removed the old air filter, which is dirty and stopped up, okay? So if your saw can't breathe good, it'll get hot on you and it'll shorten the life of the engine. So I've gone online and I ordered a kit, uh, a new air filter kit. Pretty simple. And uh, you take the old one off. You pop the new one on, and you use this wrench that I was showing you earlier to take off the bar, and you tighten the screws down on that. So replacing the air filter is an important maintenance piece I want to tell you today on your chainsaw. And when you order these kits, you can get a kit for usually less than 15 bucks. You can order them straight from Steel or Husqvarna or even Amazon. You can get those uh, replaced. Uh, the kits will come with usually a spark plug, new spark plug here. I'm going to save it until I absolutely have to have one. Uh, but you should you should check those and make sure they're not worn. Uh, the chains all run a lot better with a good spark plug. And the fuel filter. A little fuel filter here that pops right on the fuel line that goes inside the tank. You can replace that as well. Typically I replace this air filter, like this dirty one here. I've been cleaning it. I replace it about every 25 to 30 hours. Uh, the maintenance manual may tell you something different. All right. So we'll come right back and we'll take our chainsaw bar off and also show you how to sharpen the chain. Okay, so sharpening. Well, this one isn't in bad shape, but I'll show you. So if you're gonna freehand sharpen the chain, you need to just get a table, something level something that you can get a good angle on the chain with. And right now, I've got the bar running from me and I'm about a 45 degree angle from the chain. And you don't push down, okay? You simply go upwards. Little short, quick motions, okay? What you're doing is trying to get that edge sharp and unlock the chain brake. I can move the chain. And you just go all the way around like that on this side. All right, so I've sharpened my chain. I've turned it the opposite way so you can get the grooves on the other side. You have to go both directions. So we spun it around. So once I get that side sharp, as far as taking your bar off and checking things and cleaning out, and this isn't gonna be pretty because this saw gets used. So this isn't staged, this is just as is. Gonna loosen up the, the nuts just enough to turn with your hand. Take the cover off. All right, so if you can see here where the tip of my uh, file is, if I can get up there close right there, there's the oil port that allows the oil to get through on the chain. It's a 45 degree angle. It's kind of ground through. You see, I can almost get this tip through there. A toothpick works perfect. You can clean that port out so that you always have free flowing oil, bar oil to your chain. That's something that's going to stop up on you a lot, so in between cuts and in between jobs, make sure that that port is open. <laughs> 